Are you ready to revolutionize your relationship with money? Welcome to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast with The Frugal Physician, where I, Dr. Disha Spath, will be your companion on this exciting adventure. Get ready to conquer debt, build wealth, and embrace a mindful spending lifestyle that will empower you to live life on your own terms. Pearson Ravitz's story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate ob at the height of her career. But then, a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery. Her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Stephanie became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Rabbits, Stephanie founded Pearson Rabbits, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income, and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Rabbits serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRabbits.com to schedule your consultation with the Pearson Rabbits advisor. Welcome to another episode of Finding Financial Freedom with the Frugal Physician. I'm your host, Dr. Disha Spath, and today we have Dr. Jimmy Turner with us. Dr. Turner is a practicing anesthesiologist, entrepreneur, and life coach for doctors. He is the host of Money Meets Medicine podcast and the author of Determined, How Burned Out Doctors Can Thrive in a Broken Medical System. We're excited to dive deep into the intersection of burnout and finance, as well as Dr. Turner's journey from blogger to venture capital-backed co-founder of a startup. Let's get started. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? I'm doing well. Super excited to be here. Thanks for bringing me on. You've been a longtime friend and confidant for as long as I've been in this space, and your work has really influenced everyone I know at least in the personal finance world. I'm so happy to have you here. Can you please tell us about you, where you come from and what you're doing now? You know, I don't even know where to start at this point. So background, I am a a husband to a much better half and have three kids. I guess professionally, my background is an academic anesthesiologist. So I am a regional anesthesiologist. I always tell people I can numb any part of your body below your clavicles. That's what I do in medicine. Still practice a couple of days a week. Really enjoy that when I go in, procedurally based specialty. So lots of variety and immediate gratification. So very much like what I do there. And then the other few days a week, yeah, it's kind of, you know, (laughs) fluctuated over the years. So, you know, 2017 started the physician philosopher and, you know, watch that grow and, you know, kind of take the ups and downs that is entrepreneurship, you know, so that ended up turning into a couple of books, a couple of podcasts, a coaching program and, you know, just a a variety of things, basically helping physicians, you know, use financial independence to combat burnout. So, you know, financial wellness, I guess, is a better term for that. And more recently, yeah, so in February, started at a company called Attend as a chief medical officer and co-founder there in the venture, you know, capital-backed startup space. So, yeah, I guess over the last, you know, six years, it's been a transition from creating my own business and putting $5,000 into something from a you know, medical malpractice case that I did and then turning it into what it is today. So it's been a fun journey and I've just touched on a lot of things and done a lot of things, but it's been a ton of fun, constant change. The growth that you have experienced and the path that you've taken, it's just been really amazing to watch. You know, you were the physician philosopher was its own site for a while and, you know, you were doing your own thing, maintaining it by yourself and da, da, da. It's a process growing a company and then now you're venture backed. So I really want to know about how that happened and what turns you had to take. So tell us a little bit about running your company, the physician philosopher by yourself and how you founded it. Yeah. So, I mean, when you start, it's just you and you're figuring it out. And I mean, you know, back then it's like, how do I open an LLC and like get an employer identification number and a bank account? Like it's the simple stuff, right? That, you know, looking back is simple. But at the time I was like, I got to Google all this stuff and, you know, figure it out. And that's kind of what you do. And I've really learned along the way that, I mean, you can't really limit yourself. There's nothing that you can't learn, right? If you can get into medicine and become a doctor, like you can teach yourself just about anything. And so it's just a matter of 
finding the mentors, the advisors, the resources that you need to make that journey a little faster than it might have been figuring it out on your own. Those first couple of years, I didn't know that. So I was figuring it out on my own as kind of a slog and pretty slow. And I don't think I paid myself in that business for the first like 18 or 20 months. Certainly not a substantial enough number to you know move the needle. And so, yeah, that's kind of how starting a business goes as a solopreneur. I mean, you're often not paying yourself for the first two or three years when you're in business. Back then I was, you know, working 60 hours a week doing anesthesia, 50, 60 hours a week, and then putting another 20 to 25 into that business. And so I was working more after residency than I worked in residency, you know, but it's a funny thing, right? People always say, you know, entrepreneurs are the only people that are willing to work 80 hours for themselves. They don't have to work 40 hours for someone else. (laughs) And so for me, that's definitely been what I've experienced. But yeah, so started that and, you know, originally it was just a blog. I was writing three posts a week, you know, finding sponsors and that wanted to, you know, interact with a relevant audience, which, you know, obviously for both of us was physicians, Mm -hmm. you know, started monetizing it that way. And then eventually started realizing that courses and coaching provides more service to doctors. And from a business perspective, it also brings in more revenue, which allows you to grow the business and help even more doctors, right? Which is ultimately the goal, you know, ended up making a transition into, you know, courses and coaching, teaching, you know, financial literacy and career coaching. But that probably took, I don't know, three or four years to figure out. Yeah. I mean, you make some really good points there. And I think a lot of people that listen to this podcast would be interested in how a blog really turns into a business and then that business grows, right? I remember the LLC starting process. Actually, when I started my blog, I just like put a post out there, right? I just wrote something and I was like, what can I do with this? I need this published somewhere. What's the quickest way to get it out in the world? And a blog seemed like the way to go. So I just put it out there. And then for a little while, people are like, okay, now this is what you do. You just put like one post out a week and that's the formula, you know, keep it consistent, keep going and just keep putting it out there. People start asking me, you know, are you running a blog or are you running a business? Because that's the next big juncture. If you really want to make it a business, then you need a business identity and an LLC would, is a good way to structure that initially because it's solo owned it's sole proprietor income, but you are able to separate your finances out from your personal finances and the business finances. And you're setting yourself up to be able to take those deductions for business expenses, but also the income that you're going to eventually start making that has its own tax identity. And then you start to build that platform, that business. And then you get into the monetization piece, which is a really tough thing for bloggers, right? Did your advertisers come to you or did you approach them? I want to follow up on one comment you just made, actually, before I dive into that. I think the biggest mistake, you know, having coached a bunch of people that, you know, want to start entrepreneurial endeavors is they don't make a decision between a business and a hobby. And so what they end up doing is creating what I call a jobby. And like that's the worst possible place to be, right? Because you're not really intentionally making it a business. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you view this now, today, I view this as a positive thing. But back, you know, when I first started, it was hard. Business is hard. I mean, running a business is infinitely more stressful to me than anesthesia. And in anesthesia, when I make mistakes, people die. So just to put that in perspective, like entrepreneurship is stressful. If you haven't decided intentionally that this is going to be a business, you will 100% give up on it. So, you know, until you've made that transition, you're like, okay, I know long term that this has a good chance to be worth it. I would just encourage you just to make the decision. It's a hobby, fun, what you do on the side, you know, you enjoy writing or whatever, by all means, just do that. But don't live in this jobby land of in between. But monetization, Larry Keller, was the first person on my site. Love him to death. Never mind giving him a shout out. And so Larry, I actually just approached him. I saw him on other sites. He basically wanted to get to know me, see what I was doing and what I was about and you know where it was going and took a shot in the dark and he was willing to put some money into it. And that was really kind of the first foray into that. And it's hilarious because like you have no idea what to charge people. It's not like publicly available information. And so like one person might be charging thousand dollars and the next person's charging ten thousand dollars for the same number of traffic and you just have no idea the person that knows that is the person that wants to sponsor your site and they're not going to tell you that it was an interesting process of like having sponsorships approaching people as the business grew i started having people approach me and basically just increasing the number till someone said no right like that's the process that i went through to figure out okay this is the ceiling this is what people are willing to pay you know but when you first start you're just like everything else you're just trying something it's a test you run a hypothesis see what happens But yeah, no, when I first started out, I was absolutely having to reach out and try to find people on my own. You know, I had someone the other day like, hey, you know, I want to run a business idea by you because they found me on Twitter. Sure. Let's, you know, jump on a Zoom call, (laughs) see what you want to talk about. And some things are, you know, just conversations and never really go anywhere. And other conversations, you know, turn into real opportunities. But yeah, when you start, by all means, you're hustling. Yeah. I remember waking up at like 
4 a.m. before work trying to bust out a post if I could, you know, and then social media, there is you know, all kinds of promotion. And then you get the groups and you got to respond to everyone's, you know, comments and such and keep it alive. And oh, my God, it's a lot of work. And you're right. Deciding that it's a business versus a hobby when you're doing the jobby thing, you're hustling, man. Oh, my gosh. For a really not very much pay at all, right? As compared to a physician pay, even if you're getting a couple of sponsors, most of that money is going back into the business, supporting, you know, all the subscriptions you need to keep that alive and blah, blah, blah. So you made it out of the grind. You went from being a solopreneur over to a company that was actually very profitable. Then you went over to the White Coat Investor for a little while, like me. Any comments there? You know, it was a really good opportunity. You know, so what ended up happening there and like you got to you know, strike when the iron's hot. I had a post that was put up on Doximity and all of a sudden had, you know, 50,000 page views in like a week. You know, I was averaging like 20 or 25 in like a month. When that happened, approached Jim and said, hey, the blog's growing and, you know, this is the number of page views I have per month. would love to discuss, you know, potential opportunity. That was kind of my first foray into negotiations and really learned a lot on both the front end and the back end of that. And so, in a very real way, paid for, you know, a real world MBA through that experience. It was interesting, right? Because, you know, you can use other people's platforms to grow. And ultimately, you have to decide, you know, what you want to do with your business and if it aligns with, you know, other people's views and that sort of thing. And, and the fun thing about business is that there's not really a right and a wrong. There's a kind of like a chocolate and vanilla. And yeah, you got to find partners that, you know, have a similar view in terms of the direction you want to go. And, you know, if that isn't the same, then, you know, you go a different direction, which totally fine. That's just part of business. And Something I've honestly learned and it's taken me a really, really long time for all the people pleasers out there. Running a business is extremely hard because you're constantly worried about upsetting people. And in the business world, that means you will make really, really bad decisions. And so for me, I was constantly worried about like, oh no, like what if this person doesn't like me on the other end of this? And you have to wear two hats when you run a business, right? You've got to wear the personal hat, which is concerned about that sort of stuff. And then you got to wear the CEO hat. What is best for the business? Because the business is its own entity. It is not you. And separating you from your business when you started it and you run it, you're the founder, is extremely challenging, right? And even the name of the business, right? The physician philosopher, like people identified me as the physician philosopher as opposed to TPP being a business of its own. And so when I learned to separate those two things and say, okay, even this makes me uncomfortable, what is best for the business, and then making a decision from that space, you might lose some relationships. And that's okay. You got to make a decision that's best for the business because ultimately that business is there to serve other people. And so when you put your discomfort ahead of the people that you're serving in your business, for me, I started realizing, wow, that's actually really selfish. That's not what's best for the doctors that I'm serving. So you have to make tough decisions. And I'll be honest, that was really, really hard for me. It is an expensive lesson to learn. It's a journey, you know, when you realize that you have something valuable and you can grow your brand, your message can get out to a larger audience. It can be very helpful to partner with other people and 100%. get your message out. Absolutely. But the way you structure it, the way you show up to that job, whether you are in your position in the company, it really matters a whole lot to the people that are listening to you, the people that are, you know, guided by you. And I found myself in a constant state of wondering if I was doing the right thing, you know, and especially once your audience gets bigger, you tend to self-censure a little bit too, you know, because you don't want to rock the boat too much or say the wrong thing that leads some one person down the wrong path and always kind of caveating and also wondering if I'm actually representing my views in the best way, right? And the things that I care about, am I actually supporting it? And all that stuff. Like there's so much emotional and mental psychic drama going out in the background, right? People often ask, they're like, what's this deal with coaching? And in the business world, it is extremely measurable, right? You're like, well, you know, I decided to get a coach who's walked in the same journey that I'm trying to go. They have tons of learning and tons of you know experience that honestly, in a lot of ways, I paid for myself. I'm talking about like six figure sums of money to go through learning experiences that honestly, if I'd had a coach that had gone through those things themselves, it would have saved me a lot of money. Right. Because that mental drama, like it is absolutely there. Running a business is lots of psychology. It's just like personal finance, right? Personal finance is 20% math and 80% you know, psychology or behavior. And we know that, right? So we are not rational beings as much as we want to be. We're not. Your thought process plays into the decision that you make. Actually having a conversation with a mentor, advisor, coach, whoever 
about that. Turns out it's wildly healthy and provides a massive ROI. Took me a long time to learn that. I definitely went to school of hard knocks for a while. (laughs) Yeah. And that's the thing. Coaching gets a bad rap in the physician world because people think of it as money grabbing or taking advantage of other physicians. But really, it's so, so, so valuable. And you start to realize that when you get out of the regular medical journey, the medical journey path that we walk is pretty well defined. You know, you got to get to this next thing, get to associate professor, then you'll be, you know, the next step or whatever. Academia is very well defined. In the private world, it's a little less well defined, but in the entrepreneur world, it's not. And a lot of physicians are finding themselves in the space where they kind of have to find their own way. That defined path, even in medicine, is sort of disappearing because of how we've expanded. So having a coach to guide you through that is very important. Did you have a coach? Who helped you through this process? Yeah, I actually ended up getting a coach because of a lot of the business drama that I was having and uh, it was super, super helpful. Honestly, it's challenging to understand that you stay kind of stuck in analysis paralysis because of exactly what you just described, right? There's a very, very defined trajectory for physicians and then you get out of training and it's less defined, right? And that's actually really unsettling. That's you know, a big experience and a source of stress. And then in entrepreneurship, I mean, you can go whatever way you want. Like you might be creating something that's never been created before. In fact, that's often the case. And so you have no idea which way to go. It's really challenging. And honestly, I think that for me, running a business also became an arrival fallacy. And this is something that a lot of doctors struggle with. You know, like they get to residency and they're like, oh, being a doctor is going to be better than medical school. And then they get burned out. They're like, oh, being an attending is going to be what solves the problem of earning an attending paycheck or becoming associate professor, as you mentioned. And all of these things turn into, you know, what Tal Ben-Shahar calls an arrival fallacy because you get there and you realize like, oh, I'm not really any happier than I was. For me, the same thing happened in business. I was like, oh, when I get to like, I don't know, $50,000 in annual revenue, like I'm going to be super happy when I get to 100, when I get to 500, like I'm, it's just, it's not true. When you have people that have gone that journey and they're like, really what you want to try to do in your business is serve people, make it worth your while in terms of really loving and being passionate about what you do, making enough money that allows you the opportunity to do that. But at the end of the day, like, for example, scale a business. Like that's something that everyone always says, like, oh, you got to scale. And it's like, no, you don't. Like, you can absolutely run a business that makes a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, right? And you're the only person in it. You serve people. There's not a lot of overhead and be a lot happier than someone running a $2 million business. Oh, I'm so with you there. That's where I'm now. I'm just like, initially, I was in this growth, 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 growth thing. And, you know, so much pressure from everyone telling me that you got to scale and you got to figure out how this business works and blah, blah, blah. Establish your own identity as a company, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, It comes right just back down to the people that you're serving. And if you're doing it for the right reasons and you're getting that feedback that you're actually helping people and you're sticking true to what you actually believe in and there's enough money flowing so that you're able to do that, you're able to take the time away from medicine, from your paying gig to actually serve those people, then what else is there, right? It's worth it. It's counterintuitive though, because like basically, you know, even the opportunity that I'm in right now, I love what I do. I mean, on the days that I'm not at the hospital, I wake up get to work out, get to come do something that I really enjoy, meet you know awesome people like you, talk to you. And this is tons of fun for me. And hilariously, I make a lot less money doing this than I do practicing anesthesia or even when I ran my own business. But I am happier now than I was running my own business. It's not to say that you know, I couldn't sort that out, but you know, things came up and I couldn't solve the problem for you know, probably six or nine months. It was the last thing I thought about going to sleep. It was the first thing I thought about waking up. And I got to the point where I was like, this is not healthy, you know? And so right. I had to make a pivot, which I had to do several times. I made multiple pivots from a blog to a podcast. I made a pivot from a blog to books. I made a pivot to, you know, making courses and then to coaching and then, you know, the venture space. And with each of those turns, it wasn't really about making more money. It's about, you know, finding what I was passionate about, what makes me happy and serving people gives me that passion. Yeah. Finding that balance, you know, same thing as medicine. It's easy to let it consume your life and, you know, make it unbalanced. And you got to find whatever path it takes to get that balance back. So tell me more now about this venture capital thing. This is a foreign world to me. So how did it start? And like, how did you structure it all? You know, got an introduction to attend, which interestingly, so in the venture capital world, the way this traditionally works is, you know, you create a company, right, or an idea. And as you do that, you might say, hey, look, I realize that this is going to be successful and the opportunity for it to scale is massive. And so, you know, if that number, that market availability, if you will, so it's called a total addressable market, a TAM, if that is in the billions of dollars, right, it's a billions of dollars idea, 
then you can approach a VC firm and say, hey, I've got this idea. I've been running this business for a few years. This is how it could scale. This is the problem it's solving. This is who it would serve. And you pitch to them. And you know, you meet 60 VC firms and you know, 59 of them turn you down and one says, hey, yeah, that'd be great. They give you capital and they give you connections. And then you take that capital and you increase the growth of the business exponentially. The purpose of VC is to give you capital and connections so that you can grow your business exponentially faster than what you would have if you were bootstrapping yourself. Bootstrapping is fine, but you know, to get to unicorn status, which is a company that's you know, valued at a billion dollars or more, it is extremely rare for people to bootstrap something. So like, you know, the owner of Spanx, for example, bootstrapped the entire time and she, you know, created a, a unicorn, right? That is not common. <laughs> you know, you can approach VC that way. Some VC firms do what's called an incubation where they start the company there, kind of the idea that was generated at that company. And then they start it, you know, they try to find a team to help support it and to bring it up. And so that second scenario is what brought me in. There was an idea that was created to create a comprehensive financial solution based on the idea that there needs to be a brand in this space that people know that they can trust that's going to do what's best for them. My origin story going through disability insurance and an insurance agent not doing what was best for me really, you know, resonated. And, you know, that's been my North Star for six years is doing what is best for people, even if it's not the most profitable thing from a business perspective. And so the opportunity came up as we started discussing it, it became kind of clear, like I couldn't run the physician philosopher and also help out with this, you know, with a tent made the decision to go through negotiations and really try to sort out like, how could we make this work? And as part of that, you know, ended up becoming co-founder, chief medical officer at Attend and learning about this crazy world that I didn't even know existed. Like I'd heard people use the word venture capitalism before, right. but I didn't really understand what it meant. And so now, like having lived in the space for eight months, it's fascinating. They give you money, that first funding round. Let's say that they give you a million bucks. You've got $100,000 in overhead trying to make your company grow quickly. That means you have 10 months to either get the company off the ground and or prove the concept enough that you can go from that pre-seed round to a seed round where they're like, okay, we're going to give you you know, a few million dollars. And now you've got a few million dollars and now you're burning $200,000 a month and you got you know, 16, 18 months to let it grow. And then you raise more money at a series A. And so like, it's basically this game of like getting the company to scale before you run out of cash that's provided by these venture capital firms. It is you know, wildly exciting, really challenging. 90% of startups fail. And that's not just VC world. That's like the businesses that you and I created, they had a 90% chance to fail. But by starting a blog and transitioning to a podcast and growing an audience and really putting myself out there, it allowed me to have the opportunity to you know, step into this world, which has been honestly really, really fun. That sounds like a whole different world and a whole different game at a much larger scale. Tell me about Attend. Tell me what Attend does. Yeah. So as a startup, right, we are, you know, building a company kind of modularly, if you will, in terms of the services that we provide, you know, at this point, it is a tech enabled company. So there's an app, which is something that separates us. And right now, the services that we provide pop into the app, and it gives you kind of a financial checklist of things that you need to accomplish based on, you know, your stage or career and training or thereafter, and then walks you through the products that you need early on, right? So disability insurance, what I screwed up and still can't get to this day, because I made a mistake and insurance agent didn't do what was right for me. So we help people with that. We help people with student loan guidance. We help people, you know, with the financial literacy component and have some relationships with, you know, GME programs to help basically teach financial literacy to residents so that they, you know, know how to create that financial foundation. You know, and in the future, it should become basically any career or finance need that a physician has so that they can, you know, come into the, that company, come in to attend and they trust us because they've built a relationship with us and kind of in a very real way, become the USAA of physician finance, if you will. You know, except for it's not for military members, it's for, you know, medical professionals. It's something that we're super excited about and we're building it, you know, in a way that we think is transparent and doing the right thing for people. So, you know, for example, our insurance agent doesn't get paid commission. They get paid a flat salary. And the reason for that is we didn't want the conflict of the person interacting with you, trying to sell you something you didn't need because they were going to make commission off of it, which is literally what happened to me. And honestly, having been in the space for eight months and seeing doctors come in that, you know, came from recommended lists on other sites. And, you know, they had cancer or type one diabetes and the agent was trying to, you know, write them through a fully underwritten policy, which would have gotten them denied. And they're in training and have a guaranteed policy that doesn't look at their medical history, right? They didn't do the right thing. And the reason why universally is commission. You know, we're trying to build it in a thoughtful, meaningful way so that, you know, doctors are really being served and can know that they can trust that they're actually getting the best advice and the best service. Well, that's revolutionary. So you're employing these people to help write the right policy. And you don't have that bias and the, and the other motivations of, you know, people trying to earn money. 
And that's the scariest part about the financial space for people on the outside is you don't know if the person's acting in your best interest or not and what the commissions are because they're all hidden. Tell us a little bit about your origin story for the people that haven't heard it. Tell us what happened to you. When I was a fourth year med student, we had our first kid, Grace. And when we had her, she's 12 now, which is insane. She's a seventh grade. Talk about middle school drama. That is a very real thing, by the way. <laughs> but we had Grace before the middle school drama. Kristen and I, we kind of felt like a responsible adult-like thing to do is to get life insurance so that if something happened to either of us, that you know, Grace would be taken care of and the other you know, partner would be taken care of. Ended up approaching a medical school classmate's brother because I knew nothing about money. I knew zero about money at that point in my career. And so I was like, oh, this is someone I can trust. It's a brother of a medical school classmate. Seemed like a nice guy. Unfortunately, worked for a very large mutual fund company. And so I ended up saying, hey, I need term life insurance. I was like, yeah, that's great. We should also consider getting you disability insurance. And I was like, well, I don't know anything about money, but I don't have an income. So don't really understand that because I'm a fourth year medical student at this point. Right. And so I'm like, no, like, you know, I don't really think I should do that. And anyway, said no a few times, got talked into it. Well, I have an essential tremor. I've got a prior ADHD diagnosis, hence why I talk so much. And so, which turns out on podcasting is actually a strength. I ended up getting denied because they looked into my medical history. So a fully underwritten policy looks into your medical history and says, hey, is it worth taking the risk on this individual to insure them? I was going into anesthesia, very high disability rate, you know, compared to other specialties. I had a tremor in a procedural specialty, also very risky, had a psychiatric diagnosis technically in ADHD. So they looked at me and they're like, this guy's not worth the risk. And so they didn't exclude those things from my policy and say, hey, if you know, if you have a neurologic condition that disables you, we're going to not pay you, but we'll pay you for other stuff. They just said, no, you just got denied. It turns out that if you're in training, which this insurance agent you know, should have known about, so it was either bad advice because of commission or he was incompetent. I got the training and there's something called the guaranteed standard issue policy. So if you were in training and listening, you know, this next couple of minutes might be the most important you know, couple of minutes of the show. The guaranteed standard issue policy doesn't look into your medical history. Basically, there's two stipulations. You can't have been disabled, right, or are disabled, and you can't have been denied. Because I got denied as a fourth-year medical student, when I got the training, that guaranteed policy that would have literally been guaranteed regardless of my medical history was no longer available to me because an insurance agent didn't do the right thing for me. To this day, I can't get disability insurance, and I would fundamentally argue that is the number one financial task for a doctor because you and I could teach everybody everything they want to know about investing or paying down debt. But if you don't have an income, turns out that doesn't matter. So I basically had to create a career and revenue sources such that if I ever became disabled, that my income, you know, would come from multiple places. I had to figure out how to live a lifestyle where like if I got disabled right now, that we could dramatically ratchet down our spending and that our mandatory spending would be affordable based on potentially what my wife does and money we've saved, like we'd probably have to dig into our retirement, which is ridiculous. But that all happened because I didn't know anything. So I wasn't financially literate and an insurance agent didn't do the right thing for me. If you're in training, you have medical problems, please get a guaranteed standard issue policy. They are a thing. They don't exist at every single program, but they do exist to the vast majority. That was basically my origin story into the personal finance space. How frustrating that you can't go back in time and just like reverse that decision. It had such a you know, humongous impact on you and you had no idea about how humongous it would be until you were 10 years you know, away from it. And to face your own tremor in the big picture of things, and even as a physician, an essential tremor, which I'm assuming that's what you have, is regarded as this will be fine, take a beta blocker, you'll be all right, cool, you know, just keep going. But it has such a huge impact on your financial life because of this disability insurance thing and the fact that you were able to navigate around it and then turn those lemons into lemonade is really something to be said about you as a person and congratulations on you know being able to find your path around and but the thing is there's so many other people out there like you I'm sure that are going to go through the same thing probably going to find themselves in a very bad emotional situation because financially and emotionally, it's a very, very tough path and reality to face. Disability is challenging because there's two questions. And I think anesthesia is honestly perfect to answer this question, right? Because we have two questions in anesthesia every time, right? How likely is a bad thing to happen to a patient, right? In which case we want to optimize them. And the second question is, if that thing happens, even if it's not likely, how catastrophic would it be, right? So like, could I put you to sleep with you having, you know, eaten a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at four hours? Probably. 
I don't know until I wait about six hours or if I ultrasound, you know, your stomach that it is definitely empty and you're not going to aspirate. But I do know that if you do aspirate, you're going to the ICU and you're going to be very, very sick. And so like when it comes to disability insurance, it's the same question, like the likelihood of you being disabled, you know, it's not super high, right? But if you do get disabled, it is catastrophic potentially, right? And so you buy disability insurance for that second question which is an interesting thing to think through. So I basically played college soccer. I do not play soccer anymore because I was a goalkeeper and like I can't lose a hand or a foot, you know, in an injury and still practice anesthesia. It definitely impacts my life. College soccer. I had no idea about that. That's amazing. Yeah. Small division two school is not too exciting. My wife and I met, she was a center back and I was a goalkeeper. Wonderful. We're going to Spain and going to a La Liga game next month. Oh, yeah. yeah that'll be a blast. Oh my God, I'm so excited. I have no idea like what the right thing to do is or whatever, but we're just going to show up and hope for a good time. Oh, you're going to have a blast. The only game that I've been to like in terms of like that level is an EPL game. And hilariously, it was between like Newcastle and Ipswich, which are not two very good teams. I think Ipswich was actually relegated at the time potentially. But like the electricity in that atmosphere, because you're surrounded by people that actually understand soccer, right? Because a lot of soccer matches, you know, they're like one, nothing, two to one, three to two. I mean, they're not like basketball games where like 30 buckets are scored. In order to like really be excited about watching a soccer match, like you kind of have to understand the game and appreciate, you know, several passes in a row and, you know, a good move of the ball or, you know, somebody breaking somebody's ankle. One of my, if not my favorite sporting experience to date. Especially the the professional soccer players are just so fit. I mean, it's a next level of fitness and just to watch them even move around the field, it's really mind blowing. So I'm very, very excited to experience that in Spain. Tell me about the middle school drama. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, it's really interesting, right? So like, if someone had to describe me in a single word, what I hope they would say is that I'm very intentional, you know, whether it's about my marriage or about my kids or about my business or, you know, about helping people. At the end of the day, the only thing that my daughter wants from me is to listen. You know, half the time it's me sitting on her bed at night, you know, she's getting tucked in and dad, I want to tell you about my day, you know, so and so said such and such, just, you know, so and so and like, this one kid slid his desk next to mine. And like, it made me uncomfortable. And like, just talking through those things. And it's funny because she had this interesting, you know, situation happen the other day where one friend that she has doesn't particularly like another friend she has. There's like this tension. She's like the person in the middle. And so she told my wife, Kristen, the story about what happened. And it's so important to my daughter that like she is heard. She came into the room and Kristen was like, Grace, I already told you know, dad the, you know, the story. And Grace is like, but I want to tell him. Even though I had already heard the entire story, you know, just kind of sat there and listened to Grace tell me the same exact story over again. Parenting is naturally the most challenging and simultaneously somehow the most rewarding experience that I've had every day she comes home and she's like a thousand miles a minute and just like all these things. And I'm just like trying to keep up with who too. So yeah. That really says so much about your parenting though, that first of all, that you're in tune with what's going on with her in middle school. That's huge. And the fact that she's talking to you and the fact that you're listening and internalizing and trying to do the right thing. Ugh, I feel like she is so blessed to have a dad who listens. I'm blessed to have an amazing daughter. She's actually a pretty incredible little human. For me, there's really nothing more important than making sure that my little humans turn out okay and have a good experience. (laughs) 100%. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. It's always such a great time talking to you. And we did not stick to the script at all that I had written out. And I'm really, really happy about that because I feel like this conversation will stay with me for a little while and I'll be thinking about it and I'm sure it'll have an impact. Really enjoyed it. And as always, enjoyed talking with you and having a conversation. I mean, touched on parenting and Spanish soccer and <laughs> capital startups. So, you know, quite the eclectic show. Yes, exactly. And I hope people find it helpful. Jimmy, where can they find you if they want to learn more about finance and attend and what you're actually doing? The best place that I can recommend is this is a podcast. So hop over to Money Meets Medicine and you can check that out if you enjoyed hearing me speak into a microphone. And if not, then don't come over. It's fine. Hang out with Disha. <laughs> check out Money Meets Medicine for sure. Well, I've really enjoyed Money Meets Medicine. I listen to it once in a while as well. So thank you for what you're doing there. And really, thank you for what you're doing with Attend. And, you know, getting financial professionals on your payroll to provide unbiased advice to doctors. That's amazing. I'm so glad you're doing that. And let me know how I can support you in any way possible in that venture. And I think that's exactly what needs to happen in this space, you know. So, all right. Well, good on you. Appreciate the kind words. And if you want to head over to helloattend.com, that's where they can find that as well. Well, thank you. Have an awesome day and I'll see you later. You too. Take care. Now, a final word from our sponsor. 
At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit www.pearsonrabbits.com today and embark on your journey to safeguarding your future. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisors, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.